Hello, and welcome to the ALA 2021 virtual panel, The Politics, Planning, and Posterity of a Latina OX Lecture Series, Lessons from CSULB's Annual Elena Maria Viramontes Lecture in Latina O Literature. My name is Rene H. Trevino, and I am joined today by four of my colleagues from California State University, Long Beach. Introducing them in the order listed in the program, we have Methi Rojas, who organized the panels. Thank you, Methi. We have Kiki Shaver, Araceli Esparza, and Ana Sandoval. Methi, Kiki, and Ana represent our university's Department of Chicano and Latino Studies, and Araceli and I work in the English department. Also, I'd like to give a special shout out to our colleagues, Jeanette Acevedo Rivera and Dennis Lopez, uh, both of whom could not participate in this panel, but who have been, been very, very valuable to our organizing efforts over the years. So thank you to you all, I'm sure you're gonna watch. Before we get to our roundtable discussion, I would like to provide some background information on the Vida Montes Lecture Series. In fall 2014, five Latinx faculty members from the English and Chicano Latino Studies departments at CSULB began meeting to plan a university-wide event to commemorate Los Angeles native Elena Maria Vida Montes, one of the most important Chicano writers of the post 1960s Chicano movement generation, as well as the 30th anniversary of her first publication, The Moths and Other Stories, a highly regarded story collection that remains a fixture within the canon of Chicana OX literature and classrooms across the nation. As the event began to take form, so did the organizers' vision, as they quickly realized that Vida Montes inspires many more beyond only those who read her work. An active mentor and advocate for other Chicana OX and Latina OX writers, Vida Montes is a vibrant proponent of the ongoing development of the field. We agreed that our commitment to honor her work required also supporting her desire to provide a broader space for many other literary voices. From the starting point of bringing Vida Montes to campus, the organizer's intention evolved into the insistence that Chicana OX and Latina OX literature gain greater visibility within our university. Thus was born the Elena Maria Vida Montes Lecture in Latino O Literature, an annual series that has featured a diverse array of Chicana OX and Latina OX writers. At this point, I will turn it over to Methi, who will give us some more information about the authors we've hosted and our selection process. Our first speaker, uh, who was the inaugural speaker, was Elena Maria Vida Montes, pictured here. And then the authors that have followed are Manuel Munoz, who came in 2016. In 2017, we had Ura Joan Noel. In 2018, Araceli's Germay. In 2019, Sheree Moraga. And when the pandemic struck in 2020, we were in the process of bringing Javier Zamora. So the issues that we would like to address in relation to selecting an author range um, from the more uh, personal and sort of uh, campus oriented ones to the broader field um, and the changing dynamics there. In selecting an author, our committee consistently had to consider the demogra demographics of the Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex, and Latina, Latino, Latinx uh, authors, uh, ethnicity or ethnicities. The intersecting uh, questions of race, citizenship, ancestry, immigration, language, and sexuality. The difference between wanting to highlight emerging writers and wanting to connect with established ones, both again for our campus and for the exposure of these writers on a more um, uh, city, state, even national level. The difference between working with authors who had agent representation versus those that were still self-representing themselves. And this uh, oftentimes made us consider uh, fees, the difference in fees, the types of different expectations when an agent or um, a company was brought in and uh, had a list of requests for their authors. Uh, the types of writing mediums that we wanted to support and highlight and if those should shift. Uh, and similarly, then the kinds of recent publications that the authors were involved in, if their work uh, was uh, highlighting a particular aspect of their identity versus um, one that uh, maybe our audience would be more interested in um, assuming would be discussed during this uh, lecture. 
And along with that, then we also really all had to keep in mind the author draw, the audience draw, what the authors would be bringing that um, would then draw in different types of audiences, sometimes also considering how large the audience would be. Uh, in part because this also played then into the types of departmental support that we would get. Similarly, we had to think about the use of their time. Uh, as perhaps people from different departments wanted to also um, uh, have access to these authors and uh, what that time would mean if the author was coming uh, across the country versus if they were more local. You know, there was the, um, the traveling uh, expense on their bodies and minds that we had to take into consideration. The, um, the ways in which then um, our program evolved made us also consider the kinds of controversies that were going on on a national scale regarding Latino representation, Latinx representation, Chicanx representation, um, the place of women in publishing uh, and the kinds of issues around mentorship that sometimes took place between authors that were established and those that were emerging and then how we would enter that conversation by who we would be inviting uh, onto our campus and in some ways also um, uh, presenting to our students as possible mentors. So these are uh, lots of the different dynamics we had to consider and hopefully then in our discussion, we can elaborate on what that meant. And I think with that, then I'll go ahead and turn it to our next speaker. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm KT or on your program, KT Shaver. My friends and colleagues call me Kiki. So that's how everyone's referring to me here today. Uh, and also, I hope you refer to me as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my role, which is uh, unique because I actually came into the committee first as a graduate student and then as a colleague to help out. So given that I had that role as the graduate student, uh, part of my role was actually to be a part of the workshop as a student participant. And the other part was funding, right? Um, we're gonna talk about that as I get more into budgets and the honoraria and funding opportunities, uh, which are great and many, uh, and we need to be very creative <laughs> as we search those out. Uh, but starting in, it was um, Dr. Anna Sandoval. She was my mentor uh, as uh, going through my program. And she approached me as a student and said, hey, we're bringing this wonderful author. And as soon as I heard it was Vera Montes, I was like, yes, how can I help? What, a, what do you want me to do? And uh, worked on opportunities with our student government and the uh, ASI um, associated students in presenting proposals and was able to actually get a very large windfall so that we actually could, or the committee at that time could bring Vera Montes. So that was wonderful. And then I continued on as a participant and then as colleague um, or uh, on the committee, it was wonderful because what I feel is the beauty, at least within our own committee, is no one person is always in charge of everything. So I love that we each have discussions, conversations every month. We have monthly meet. This is a like year long process plus to bring the next author together. So we come together, we bounce ideas off of one another. And even though someone may do a similar uh, role every year, like there's the logistics coordinator, ordering the books, um, you know, making sure the author is taken care of, how are they getting back and forth from uh, the hotel or their airfare. We all have a hand in that. And what I love is repetition. And we remind each other from year to year. So people do get specialized in what they're doing, but also we uh, tend to absorb many different talents, right? And uh, create many new skills for ourselves and for one another. Um, so those have been my roles. Largely, I'm going to talk about budgets uh, when we go into discussion. Uh, six big areas, really, to consider, and that's the author's honoraria, um, food, right? You cannot have a gathering without food and meals. So there's always the reception, maybe a lunch, maybe a post event dinner. Uh, Want to talk about the workshop itself. For us, it's been very minimal cost. Um, lecture, right? Lecture is probably our least expensive other than, you know, we brought the author to um, our campus, so the honoraria. And then we might need to consider, you know, um, 
things like space rental, you know, maybe some tech fees. We, uh, we brought, um, oh gosh, how long have we been taping this now for maybe about five of the six years, I want to say. So a few little dollars here and there that you might want to consider for posterity to make sure that you continue uh, the legacy <laughs> of the program. And then uh, maybe a little bit of incidentals for publicity, uh, banner creations. We finally have a banner with our logo on it. Uh, it's wonderful. The next area I'm going to talk to you about briefly again during discussion is the honoraria. A few do's and don'ts that we've learned along the way. Um, and also what I want to say about honoraria is don't limit yourself on uh, the people that you think you may not be able to afford. Because what we've found is also that we can afford them, right, with a lot of creative work and also through um, some of the generosity of the authors. So I'm going to say never limit yourself um, in who you think you can and can't bring to campus. And then finally, we'll talk about those funding sources. Three primary funding sources within the university, right, looking at your departments and other programs and grants. Uh, next, going back to your student orgs, they are so excited to help us. And then moving outside the university, writing other grants. Um, I'm going to talk about, or Anna is going to help me talk about the, our Long Beach Arts Council, which was really excited to help us and step in. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to toss it over now to uh, Dr. Araceli Esparza. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna talk about the creative writing workshop. Uh, and um, I, I'll point out that the majority of CSUOB students are first generation working class and students of color. Therefore, part of our goal is to prioritize creating opportunities for our students to interact with Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex, and Latina, Latino, Latinx authors in ways that they might not otherwise have the opportunity to do. Uh, thus promoting a central aspect of Viramontes' mentorship. One way we have done this is by organizing a creative writing workshop with our guest author that 20 to 25 students have participate, participated in on a yearly basis, with the exception of 2020 and 2021 <laughs> due to COVID. <laughs> students are, uh, from across the university who identify as creative writers are invited to apply to participate in the workshop and we typically receive more applications than we can accommodate. We have decided to limit the number of participants in order to create a more intimate space where each student can interact with the author one-on-one -on -one at least once. Applications require a creative writing sample and a statement of why students want to participate in a workshop with a particular guest author. Typically, we establish a smaller committee from members of this group uh, um, and, uh, to review the applications and um, in addition to the two committee members who wouldn't, were not able to join us today, uh, uh, Dennis Lopez and Janet Acevedo Rivera. Because, of our, uh, because most of us assign the guest author's work in our courses during the semester that they are visiting, many of the students are familiar with and often greatly admire the author's body of work. This familiarity with the author's work helps give special significance to the workshop experience for students, especially because many of them have never had the opportunity to personally interact with a published creative writer or to attend a literary re reading. The fact that the authors we have invited are Latinx also has particular meaning for our students because as students mentioned seeing uh, as student, students often mention, seeing and interacting with a published author of color allows them to be more optimistic about and committed to developing their own work. The other thing students uh, tend to remark on is how accessible and welcoming the authors uh, we invite are, leading them to recognize that published authors are everyday people who have uh, mastered the craft of creative writing through ongoing dedication. In terms of logistics, the writing workshop, um, uh, the writing workshops are, are, we have organized are approximately an hour uh, and 15 minutes to an hour and 45 minutes long. However, we have found that the shorter time span goes by too quickly. And we have opted more recently to run the workshop uh, at about an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes in order, in order to allow for more time. At the workshop, we set up tables in a circle in order to uh, try to create an intimate sense of community 
And I'm gonna share, um, let's see here. I'm gonna share uh, my, um, some pictures of the workshop. Here's Elena Maria Viramontes interacting <laughs> with one of our former committee members. Uh, Manuel Muñoz interacting with our students. Ura Joan Noel uh, at the workshop he hosted with our students. Aracelis Germay and Cherry Moraga. And you can see that the students, you know, the, the students that really are closest to the to the speaker often um, are a little starstruck, <laughs> but um, then they also begin to recognize that the uh, you know the person that they're sitting next to is just a human being. <laughs> um, uh, we also provide uh, participants with snacks, writing utensils, a notebook, and during years when funding permits, we have purchased one of the guest author's books for, the, for workshop participants. Both students and guest authors have commented on what a welcome surprise these small details are. So um, I think one of the things about the workshop is that it's, um, it, it, uh, students really appreciate being able to interact with our guest author, but then all the small details um, that we've taken care of are also really appreciated, um, again, by both the author and the student participants. Um, I think overall, we've, we're happy with the way our writing workshops have gone, and we look forward to re resuming them in the future. And with that, I'll hand it all over to Dr. Anna Sandoval. Thank you, Araceli. Um, I'd like to thank all of the organizers of the conference and uh, those of you who helped put together this panel meet me. Thank you so much. And Renee, as always, for technical work. Um, so uh, my section is going to be talking about um, a great opportunity for all of you to help us uh, keep this wonderful series going in perpetuity. Um, and so um, as my colleagues have mentioned, uh, about six years ago, our conversation started and uh, to, to create this series. And we have uh, had five years of success in bringing authors and in raising funds on an annual basis. Um, the series has gained um, local and national accolades Yet it's been a great deal of work as uh, you probably have gleaned from, um, from my colleagues' comments. Uh, there's a lot of organizing happening. Um, everybody is involved in outreach to campus organizations, to uh, arts organizations off campus and on campus. Um, and because the fiscal calendars work differently for different organizations, Sometimes uh, we wouldn't know if we had all the funding we wanted until a month before, sometimes a few weeks before. And so this, of course, um, affected what we could do um, with the students, uh, with the reception. So um, while we've been successful over those five years, um, we can't guarantee that every year we're going to be able to reach that goal that we hope to reach. Um, so we have um, talked about creating an endowment. And so this is how um, you all can help um, if you're able to. Um, so our goal is to create an endowment um, so that this series will exist in perpetuity, okay? So when all of these wonderful colleagues of mine um, have retired and um, our supportive administrators are perhaps not on campus anymore to you know, uh, generously give us fun financial support, um, we will have a, the guarantee that um, this series will continue. And so in order for that to happen, we have a goal to raise $250,000 over a five-year period. Um, so if you, and what, what that would do 
um, would um, give us our, our designated budget, um, which we can talk about more in the, uh, in the conversation later. Um, but um, that will give us that much um, money each year. And we won't have to start over every single year because as, as, as Kiki mentioned, the, the planning process is almost a year. So we have our, our speaker you know, for that year. And then a month later we meet and we start doing grant applications and doing outreach, right? To raise the money. Um, if we have this endowment, we already know that money's there and we can just focus on the logistics of um, you know, bringing the authors and creating the writing workshops and you know, you know, preparing a, a, a wonderful event. And, um, and so if you would like to be a part of creating this endowment to bring this annual lecture to CSULB, um, this event that celebrates a community of Latina and Latino writers and poets that gives students the opportunity to workshop um, with these writers and offers the community a rich program to look forward to every year. Please consider donating and or helping us to publicize our efforts. Soon we will have a link um, on, our, on our website and then they will talk a little bit more about the website later. Um, in order to donate. So we will have a link there that you can click on to donate. But there's also um, a development uh, director within our college. The College of Liberal Arts is where the English department and the Chicano Latino Studies department is housed. So the development director, I'm going to share um, their information, uh, is Howie Fitzgerald. And uh, here is his number and his email. The development assistant is Becky uh, Zeffirino uh, and her phone number and email is listed there. And then of course, if you have any questions um, that you want to ask me, um, I'd be happy to talk with you as well. Um, and um, there is my email um, on the screen. So please know that any amount helps and if you perhaps are unable to um, contribute financially, if you would like to share ideas, if you would like to talk with me, if you have some terrific ideas about fundraising, or if you um, have networks that um, you think would be interested in helping out, um, please share those ideas with me. Um, and I, I'm open to, to all ideas and all possibilities. This is something that we really want to make happen. Um, five years has gone by quickly since we've had these events. I'm sure the next five years, um, you know, will also um, seem to go surprisingly quickly. Um, but I'm hoping that in five years, we will have this endowment established. And so with your help and with your support, um, we can make that happen. So um, I, I'd be happy to talk more about it when um, my colleagues and I have a discussion um, after um, after we all we all have presented. So thank you for listening. Okay, thank you everyone for sharing those overviews. I think now's a good time to get into a general discussion now that we're all back to gallery view and can all see each other. Um, where to begin? There is the issue of who to bring to campus, how to select that particular author. And then we have these other aspects, the funding, the workshop, and trying to you know, raise a money for an endowment that aren't really author dependent. You know, we've been running them basically the same way, regardless of the author. So does anyone have a preference and, and where to begin? A good, good area to really maybe start because there's such a um, talk in the media, at least, about representation. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Uh, so representation of the types of authors. We know that uh, this wonderful new movie that came out in the Heights, right, is receiving uh, scrutiny and criticism for its lack of representation of certain Latinx communities. So I think uh, that's a really good place for us maybe to leap off. I saw the headlines, but I didn't read the stories and I didn't see the movie. But uh, I heard, you know, I heard it got good reviews, but then I did see some of this uh, controversy and I, and I agree. It's probably um, the most pressing issue when you're thinking about this type, especially this type of lecture series, who to bring and why and what it means to the campus community. Any thoughts from, from others on that topic? Um, I, I can add something. I think one of the things that the committee has been very conscious of, because we are in Southern California, and Southern California is very Chicana, Chicano, Chicana eccentric, um, is that we want to make sure that the committee is bringing authors that represent the diversity of Latina, Lat Latino, Latinx um, identities. And um, one of the ways we've done that is by thinking about questions of national origin and then uh, and ancestry, and then also by thinking about questions of gender and sexuality. Um, so I think at least three of the <laughs> of our guest speakers uh, are LGBT um, uh, um, identified, and um, the other um, uh, the two are. Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex, two are of um, Puerto Rican ancestry. In terms of Araceli's um, uh, she's Afro-Latina, um, African-American, and Eritre Eritrean, I, I believe is um, uh, um, how you pronounce it. And, um, and so I think that thinking about and, and then with Javier Zamora, our, our, he was going to be our first uh, uh, Central American, U.S. Central American author um, of Salvadoran. He um, was a Salvadoran child migrant. Um, <clears throat> so it was um, in, in terms of thinking about how these authors speak to the pressing political questions of our time. Um, uh, um, is something else that we consider, and I think that's very much in line with Vida Montes' work with her mentorship, with um, the way she thinks about creative writing as a, a, a political force, um, as making a political intervention so that creative writing is not seen as something that um, is merely aesthetic or for entertainment, but rather as something that um, um, contributes to politics and political change in, in our society. But any other thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, absolutely. Um, Araceli, thank you. You, you really um, highlighted so many key things that um, have been ongoing concerns for us and also points of inspiration. And I mean, to bring it back to Vida Montes, um, the work that she did for decades um, both here in Los Angeles and then even after she became uh, a professor of creative writing at Cornell University continued and really continues to do um, that we really that was such a, a, a an impetus for us for what we wanted to do with the writers that we would bring and the kinds of relationships we hope that they could uh, initiate with our students right was to have it be from a place of growth and um, inclusion and promotion of voices, right, that had been marginalized, erased, and so forth. And so I think um, one of the wonderful things is that each time that we meet to figure out who we are going to bring, we all come with a good list, right? Um, and there is some overlap, but the nice thing is we all come with different names and have such a great, healthy discussion that, again, I think is also selfishly very invigorating, right? Like we get something out of it as we learn about um, authors from each other and also um, push ourselves to think about maybe some of our own limitations. You know, one of the, I think really key things about this series has been the way in which we've all been able to grow personally and, and keep sort of thinking through our own politics and our own um, interests and, um, and, you know, again, who to, um, think about that we may have not have thought about. So they've been really great discussions. I know um, one of the really interesting points with um, 
uh, the last speaker that we weren't able to bring because of the pandemic with Samora, we also had to um, think through, and maybe this is where some of, uh, with Kiki and um, Anna, that we can bring in also the logistics of like also funding was, um, you know, he is uh, very open about his undocumented status and his special status at the moment, given, you know, uh, his ability to gain a visa through um, his creative writing, but the um, uncertainty of his place here in the United States. And of course, uh, the entire process of his migration. And again, what he represents um, in terms of other people like him, right? Um, and many of whom are our own students, right? And sort of thinking through, well, how do we even pay this individual? How does that work? Like how, um, who in, in going through the process of selecting him, who, do we need to think about that maybe we couldn't have brought for some of these same reasons or how could we have brought them, right? So I really thought that that's that one of the best benefits of being on this committee is what we personally, um, the way we grow from it, and, right? Uh, so I'll just sort of stop there because I imagine that our colleagues have a lot to say about Thank you, Maithi and Araceli. I'm gonna jump in because Mathie and Araceli um, covered, uh, let me see, gender, sexuality, you know, regionality, the geopolitics of it. Um, a couple of other concerns when we're talking about representation is genre. You know, are we gonna bring a novelist? Are we gonna bring a short story writer? Are we gonna bring um, poets? And I think we've had a nice mix of all of them, especially considering the workshop. We want to cater to and appeal to students, uh, creative writing students from all areas. So we've done a nice job to mix it up. We've even had a few students uh, who were able to attend twice, uh, you know, so they got a novelist maybe one time and then, um, uh, you know, a, a poet another time. Um, another aspect is accessibility, right? Somebody who really speaks to our students, which I think all of them have in one way or another, um, but the accessibility of their work. And then um, woo, maybe we're gonna get into a little dicey area, but also <laughs> the area of um, representation. So I know originally when the committee was searching uh, for authors, really trying to promote up and coming authors, right? We've also had some more prominent headliner names, uh, but also getting our students familiar or the community at large familiar with those authors that maybe don't have a national uh, spotlight. Um, and then also, I think this came up in discussion right before uh, we came on, but authors who are supportive of the community, right? Who advance one another's work. So there's so many wonderful discussions that we have. Uh, sometimes um, not fast discussions by any means, but trying to balance all of these ideas. So maybe somebody else wants to speak further. Um, I just wanna uh, talk a little bit about um, that process that many of you touched on, um, the discussions we would have about which authors to bring. Um, it was also important to us to know that the authors that we would bring in, since they would be coming, um, you know, in the name of this lecture series named after Elena Maria Viramontes, that she would also be supportive of these writers. And so um, uh, that would outreach out, to, I would reach out to her and let her know, you know, these are writers we are considering. And, you know, luckily, wonderfully, right? It was like we're of the same, uh, on the same wavelength with that, but she, she was always very excited. She was always very excited and very supportive of the authors that the committee selected. Um, of course, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't want to bring someone um, again, that was, you know, in, in her name, right, of, of the series um, that, that she wouldn't support. And as others have mentioned in comments earlier, um, she's just been an amazing mentor, an amazing inspiration. Um, and so uh, we are just so, so excited that all of the authors we've invited have been just thrilled, absolutely thrilled. Um, to participate in a way for them, it was a way also to honor Elena Maria Viramontes, right? And the, the important work that she has done and that she continues to do. Um, so that, that was always very exciting just to sort of see, um, 
you know, how uh, everything really uh, meshed together well. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to say about that. If it seems like these are quite a few considerations when it comes to selecting an author, because there, there really are, and there's a reason why we titled this part of the talk, Politics, Selecting an Author, because there are these considerations and some of the more difficult conversations that we've had recently uh, were about authors that have become, uh, or you know, at, at the time of the discussions were at the center of uh, some particular controversy. And this controversy, uh, maybe not entirely known to students uh, who want a particular author to come to, to campus. And so we have to even factor that in, into our decision. And uh, in at least uh, two cases that come to mind, uh, speaking generally, um, th th that has been part of our consideration because it matters. And we want, as Anna said, we want to, to keep the good reputation of this lecture series alive and not sacrifice that reputation um, by, by bringing in authors that um, would not necessarily be the best fit for, for the time, for the students, for the campus community. I don't know if anyone else would like to, to join in on, on that particular topic. That part of it as well, and other things. You know, I want to, uh, I don't, uh, I'd like to also include the aspect of the politics then, um, along with what you're bringing up, Renee, um, how then they're perceived by the actual campus, right? I mean, you had um, certain names that excited uh, department chairs, department faculty, um, other, outside of our own, as well as in our own. Um, and then others that uh, were either off-putting or because they weren't known to the departments, then, you know, not of interest. And of course, then that bounces back into what, uh, you know, Anna and Kiki have shared about the funding, right? Because um, it is a precarious experience every year to figure out financially how we're going to make it work. And part of it is the selling, right, and the buy-in from various um, uh, power brokers on our campus. And going beyond departments, obviously, the college as well, and, and even at the, the top administrative level. So certain names definitely would draw that interest, and others didn't. And yet we had to really balance that again, to go back to Araceli's point, what our commitment was to um, these newer authors who need to have uh, platforms like ours. Um, and who we ourselves have, you know, tried to create in our classrooms platforms for. So it's, I think it's a complicated uh, politic in and of itself around the, the financing and selling, you know, and I hate using those sort of marketplace words. And yet, you know, that's kind of where we often find ourselves in academia, having to negotiate that. Any other thoughts? And I'll add here that we're roughly at about 45 minutes in. So I'm gonna suggest maybe we go to the funding area okay. next. Yeah. So with what Maythe just ended on, I think is a good time to transition to funding. As I mentioned first, we probably, you wanna establish a sort of a budget, um, a vague budget <laughs> because it's going to move. <laughs> um, but obviously the largest area that you have is the honoraria and then again, um, uh, food, right? You can't build comunidad without a fiesta. <laughs> so we definitely need to consider those things if possible. Um, but I wanted to say with the honoraria, uh, don't eliminate anybody. So I want uh, any committee who's or any group that's thinking of building, uh, you know, a lecture series similar to this, to decide on what's an appropriate honoraria, what do you think you can manage, and learn the lesson that we did one year we sent a beautiful invitation letter without giving um, that author uh, a sort of parameters. We can possibly provide an honoraria from X amount to, you know, Z amount. And uh, when they came back, we, uh, with a very uh, larger amount than we were prepared, uh, we were excited to bring them. So we found a way <laughs> to bring them. However, I think that was probably one of the years where we were stretched very close. It took right up until the last few weeks that we got all of our funding. So you also don't want to put your committee under that kind of stress either. Um, you know, if you're excited about it, that's, that's really great and people work together. But the other thing that we found is that authors are so generous. If you come in, 
and you say, this is the amount we have, they are very um, capable of saying, yes, we will come and we will work with that sliding fee scale uh, or no, thank you and move on. So that's where I think is uh, be prepared to do what you think you can do and then stretch yourself a little bit beyond, <laughs> but also don't, uh, don't eliminate anybody and also don't bring yourself under too much stress, right, for somebody who is um, excessive and beyond your reach. Um, the thing that you want to also consider with honoraria is sometimes uh, the airfare, the incidentals, the airfare, hotel, ground transportation are baked into that honoraria. Other times you'll have to consider doing that on top of the honoraria. So be clear who you're working with, whether it's the author themselves, the agents, Etc. what is actually going to be taken care of in that honorarium. Um, food and meals, we have a very small lunch uh, for the author, you know, the committee members, and maybe some department chairs, might be just a few hundred dollars. The reception is open to the community. That's usually the big ticket item, and we want to find a um, groups that will help support that, but that also is accessibility. This is where we put the author in front of students, especially. Um, and then maybe a post lecture. Once in a while, it's still nice to take this author who has been with your community for 10 or 12 hours out to dinner and satisfy that need. Once in a while, they might just want to go home <laughs> and, and take the day or take the rest of the night off. Um, you'll want to consider any um, space rental fees with the rooms that you book. Um, the workshop is usually very minimal. You've got maybe a few snacks, a pen, um, a writing instrument, and I think uh, Araceli or somebody mentioned it earlier, we're able to provide books a couple of years for the author. One year when we got a very large Cal Humanities grant, we were able to get two books. This was the year we had Araceli Skidmai, and uh, we got two books for the students. They were overjoyed. She was just very tickled. So it's nice to leave that little parting gift um, with them, uh, or that they actually have this 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 work by this author. Um, so space fees, I think I talked about that. Maybe there might be some tech fees that you'll want to look into. We always had a tech assistant on hand because even though we felt very versed in what we were doing, nobody uh, you know, knows their room better that they work in every day. So that was a very nominal fee, $50, $75, you'll want to check. And then at one point, um, the free rental equipment, video rental we, equipment that we got was uh, no longer working for us. So we had extra money one year and we bought a camera. So now we can videotape. Uh, so that might be something that you look at down the line. Um, and then publicity, I think, can be ver done very minimally. We did posters around on campus, but largely well, now with social media and the dissemination of electronic information, uh, we got by without doing too, too much there uh, or, exp or expensing too much there. Um, so funding sources, I'm going to talk about within the university. And I think all of us have spoken to uh, the cross-disciplinarity, right? Being able to reach out to other departments, seeing where you know, our speaker might be a fit with other departments. Right now, English and Chicano Latino studies are the biggest contributors as far as departments go. We also have scholarly intersections. Araceli, do you wanna jump in and talk about scholarly intersections? It seems like you've worked with them the most. Uh, scholar on our campus, Scholarly in Intersections is an initiative, a funding initiative um, established by our dean, um, David Wallace. And the idea is that uh, faculty members work across departments in order to put together events. And um, that um, is by uh, a proposal-based um, basis. There's a committee on campus. We submit our proposal every year. Um, uh, and because we already are working across departments <laughs> in, in the committee itself, um, uh, we're able to put that proposal together and we basically explain what the event will contribute to the campus community and um, how multiple departments, both within the College of Liberal Arts and beyond, um, and perhaps even into the, the local community will benefit from the event that we're proposing. And I, I just, just very briefly, I, I'm also gonna add that um, 
this event is a fairly large event on our campus. Um, it's uh, very well received. People um, in, I think, all of our departments and um, outside of our departments, including our dean, have said, you know, this is one of the best events on campus every year. <laughs> so we um, people really appreciate us doing uh, putting this event together. And I'll just mention the numbers just very briefly. We've had um, two to three hundred and fifty audience members during the um, the um, literary reading. Uh, on the lower range, we one year we made the mistake of scheduling, I think it was during um, Easter week or something like that. <laughs> so we had a lower turnout on a Thursday because it's uh, people were observing a uh, religious holiday, I think. Um, um, at the reception, usually we have 100 to 200 people and the author is at the reception. So people get to interact with the author in a uh, very intimate way. Um, we often have to make sure the author has time to read, I mean, to eat, <laughs> you know, by stealing them away from the, from the crowds and saying, please <laughs> grab some food and um, so that they can, again, nourish themselves. The lunch that, um, the smaller lunch that Kiki mentioned is usually about 15 people, people at that lunch. And um, the workshop that I talked about is 20 to 25 people. So uh, for, across the campus, we are able to, um, reach a large number of people. And it really, one of the comments from uh, Viramontes that really stays with me is that, um, so after the reading, we usually have a book signing and Viramontes was signing books. I think it was for two hours and we were just so thankful for her, <laughs> for her patience and willingness to do that for our students and our community. And, um, when I, I was thanking her, but the thing she said was, I don't mind at all. One of the things that I'm grateful for is that this really shows that you all are teaching students to love literature, right? The fact that students were willing to wait in line for two hours for a signature, <laughs> I think it's, re it's remarkable, but it really speaks to um, the impact that these events are having on a um, university campus, which I think like many university campuses doesn't have a representation when it comes to creative writing instructors or faculty that, uh, of color. Um, so that's also part of the reason that students um, clamor to the event, I think. Um, it, the one last thing, and this doesn't have anything to do with budget, but the thing, and what I've outlined is a very busy day Right, <laughs> and so we always make make sure that the author has downtime, and we offer usually one of our offices for the author to be able to just sit and not be around others if if they need that that time. So it's just something to uh, to keep in mind in terms of the 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 schedule I've outlined. You know, we do give our author our guest authors um, um, sufficient downtime. It's not a tenure track job interview after all. <laughs> Thank you. And if I could just add just uh, very quickly, internal external funding, make a case for the fit between the lecture series and the, the grant application. Even if it only seems vaguely related, you can always make the case. Uh, the authors, their work, the lecture series, our departments, they're, they're so rich that there's always some connection that you can make. So don't look at a grant application and automatically disqualify it because you think it might not be a good fit. Let them make that determination. So that would be just my one piece of advice when it comes to funding is just do your best, always make your case, and more often than not, it works out. And uh, I just would like to say for those of you who are interested in organizing this type of event on your campus, um, you don't have to do this and take, you know, the, uh, this uh, large of a, of a program, right? So maybe you can start off small with the writing workshop for students or, or a smaller lecture or don't have a reception if you don't um, if you either don't have the people power, right, or the funding resources to do a larger event, you can start off small. Um, one of the things that I wanted to 
you know, say about my wonderful colleagues is that working with others has, has given me the opportunity to do something that I have loved doing my whole career. And that is bringing writers and artists um, um, and scholars, um, videographers, right? Uh, just people who work in cultural production um, to our campus. I've been doing that since, um, you know, my first year uh, as, as a new faculty um, at Cal State Long Beach. And I did it with the support of small grants from the college, um, from my department. Um, but eventually that money went away, right? And so um, again, a lot of work for one person, but working with a group like this and having this kind of collaboration between departments has really I think allowed all of us to fulfill our dreams, right? Of bringing, or one of our dreams of bringing the, you know, these amazing writers to campus. We all have, um, you know, the masters or PhDs in literature writing. So, you know, we went into this field because of our love of literature and our love of these writers and how these writers have really transformed our lives as individuals, right? But then we have the privilege of seeing how these writers transform our students' lives, right? And our communities, telling our communities stories. Um, and so um, it doesn't always have to be large scale, right? I guess is, is the point I'm making. If you are committed to these kind of events, um, but again, you don't have the resources all at once, start small and then it maybe it can gain momentum because it is, um, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like bringing this kind of event to your community. It's, it's uh, one of the most gratifying uh, things I think um, that, uh, that my career has offered me is bringing these kind of events to campus. Any other thoughts on funding sources or should we move on to the workshop? Some more thoughts from anyone about funding? I just want to tickle a couple of them real quickly. Sure. Yeah, because, absolutely. Um, Renee and what Anna and Renee alluded to exactly is building um, contacts. And uh, I, I look, Renee, you didn't use the word marketing, but selling, right? Or maybe maybe said that, selling it to other departments. And I think that's where um, bringing in committee members who are excited to do this work from other departments is really helpful. Our colleague, uh, Jeanette Acevedo Rivera couldn't be here. Free, she's from one of uh, the Spanish, our language department. So what was wonderful is um, we haven't talked about student orgs yet, but Jeanette was able to hook us up with the Spanish Graduate Student Association. They were able to give us small funding to provide those snacks and the little pens and things like that for the workshop. Our English Graduate Student Association, something I was involved in, that very first year and for a couple of years afterward, they were able to provide quite a bit of funding actually that actually went to part of the reception, part of the honoraria, et cetera. And I think we've gotten uh, funding from communication studies, geography, uh, things like that. Anna, you secured something from the library, right? We also did something on, from the President's Commission on the Status of Women, right? Being able to speak to how that author uh, was applicable there. And then when we talked about outside funding, the one year, and one of my other colleagues is going to have to speak on this about the Cal Humanities Grant, which is a huge undertaking effort, but it was so worth it that year, right? We were flush with money. We got the author everything we wanted um, and uh, had a very nice reception that year, but also the Long Beach Arts Council, right? So looking creatively within the community to see who will support these efforts. So I don't know if anybody else wants to speak a little bit more on the last two I mentioned. Um, I just, I'd like to mention, well, De yeah, can I say Dennis Lopez's name? We already mentioned him, right? He was the, the first person, the first community member that, that gained us that successful grant that Kiki's talking about. We actually had money before we started fundraising, right? I mean, for that year, it was amazing. We were all so excited about that. Um, so that was the one year we got the Cal Humanities, and that was a big deal. Um, one of our early uh, 
early uh, committee members was Griselda Suarez, and she is currently the executive director of the Arts Council of Long Beach, and um, they have uh, grants as well. So we applied for those grants, and each year we applied, we were able to get um, money from, uh, from the Arts Council. We also applied to Poets and Writers that funded us uh, two different years. Um, so not all of these are huge amounts of money, but again, everything adds up. Um, and our student association on campus, Associated Students, has been very generous as well, as I think Kiki mentioned. Um, so uh, do not, um, again, do not uh, um, hesitate to ask, right? You might be surprised who says yes and how much you know, how much they're going to give you. <laughs> That's always very exciting. Any other thoughts on funding? Quick time check. We're about an hour in, so we have 15, 20 minutes or so to continue the discussion. Um, I'm not sure if we have more to say um, about the endowment other than please give when the link is up on our website. Um, that's very much appreciated, of course. Um, but we might have a few more things to say about the workshop, at least I do, but I'd like to give others a, a chance to speak about the workshop if they'd like. I think it might be uh, prudent for us to talk about why we started with an hour and 15 minutes talking about the class time, you know, trying to only interrupt one class, but then how we found it, that's not enough time. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important uh, consideration. We're trying to, on the day of the event, uh, disrupt normal activities. We wanna keep the disruptions to a minimum. So that that's something you might wanna consider. Uh, we were thinking of not only the class time, but also time for lunch, time for the author, um, to have some downtime. So yes, absolutely. Very good point. Trying to make it to where the students can participate, of course, but also not disrupt their normal schedule too much. I think it's also worth noting um, the students that we've attracted. I mean, sometimes we're surprised by some of the people that, um, you know, put in applications. They're from, you know, sometimes the sciences, mm -hmm. right? Very much outside the humanities, as well as certainly um, those within the humanities. But it's, it's, I think, yet another aspect of how far reaching our event has become that we can sort of draw in people from so many um, walks of life, if you will, on campus. Um, and for us, I think, again, to uh, sort of highlight another selfish um, but incredibly rewarding element is that. Um, normally there's a group of us within the committee. For a time, it was everyone on the committee, but I think as we got more and more applications, we ended up just um, having a, a, a small subgroup of the committee review them. But it's always fascinating too, to hear their own stories and how they think about their writing. And it's also forced us again to have conversations about what kind of writing samples we always ask of them we should consider. So if it's going to be only uh, creative work or can it also include critical work? Um, and even within that, um, what kinds, right, of critical or um, creative work to include, um, you know, because there is a judgment element as we're looking at all of this. So I found that to be um, an enriching process, even as it's a complicated one and certainly adds to the workload, you know, in terms of what uh, we have to consider. Uh, and it's, I think it's been really wonderful that we've been able to accommodate just about everyone. And at the same time, um, our numbers have been really uh, be, uh, not uh, high in terms of who um, has wanted to join our project. You know, we, it's not like we've had to beat the bushes. There really has been like a really diverse, large group of uh, students wanting to join. Right, and I'll add one of the things that we learned uh, maybe one or two years into the writing workshop. One thing that we added to the application was asking students to describe their connection to this type of literature. Uh, it's not something that we asked for initially, and we found that students wanted creative writing practice, which is great, but didn't necessarily have a connection to the literature, this type. And so if part of the lecture series, the goal is to strengthen the field, to grow the field, to get people interested in the field, we made sure in the, the applications of the recent past 
to, to ask students about that in particular as a way to, as Methi said, e evaluate their application. Not only do they want to be in the room because they want to be better writers, but because they're interested in either the work of the author or in the field in general. Any other thoughts on the workshop? And I'll just add, I agree with Methi. It's very rewarding to see the students in the room with, with the authors. It's, it's one of my favorite parts of the, of the entire event. I also think it sets us a little bit apart, right, from other um, universities that bring authors that we really, um, like it's very forefronted uh, for us in the series. It's, um, it's almost as essential as the lecture itself. And I think sometimes it surprised uh, the authors we brought in, in a positive way, right? They weren't expecting to have that much contact with students and they always walk away with just really wonderful things to say about the students that they've gotten to meet. And so um, I think in some ways it's become a selling point uh, to bring in these authors that they get the special access. Okay, any thoughts about if we want to return to the endowment or we have about 10 minutes or so if people have some closing thoughts. I wanted to just um, circle back to what Anna said. Um, for those of you uh, viewing this, Anna recently retired. Um, and uh, so in some ways, you know, she, her joining us today is even more special. Um, it's just, she was, she really was such a big part of it, but really um, I think every committee member that's come in um, was brought in to some degree by another committee member, if that makes sense. Like a lot of the uh, ways that this originated was through hallway conversations and also through just the growing of an actual Latinx faculty, um, focused on literature, right? Um, and it's been sort of at least one of my secret agendas is to keep growing the number of Latinx faculty who look at literature um, on, with, uh, on Chicano and Latino literature and theory. And so I, there's a, I mean, Anna was doing a lot of this alone for a long time. Um, and then, you know, I was fortunate to join her and then uh, Dennis and Araceli, Dennis Lopez and Araceli, who came in, and Kiki as being um, both an undergraduate and a graduate student, and now a um, an actual part of the faculty as, a, as one of the, our lecturers. Um, and then Renee and Jeanette, who I believe came in in the same cohort. So there's this sort of like really um, familia aspect to it, but also, you know, there's that's among us, but then to the university, there's also this validation of our field, the understanding that it's a dynamic uh, field and that the voices coming into it are going to have different perspectives. And that's a good thing. You know, it can't be represented by just one or two people or one or two areas. So I really want to underscore that um, for anyone looking to create this is to, to really think on that level as well. There's an ideological element to it that's really, really important to, um, to, to keep uh, hope to keep uh, your eyes on, you know, to, to really keep pushing forward um, because really it's about shifting narratives about um, whose storytelling is taking place, right, on our campus and beyond. Thank you for your comments, Mayday. I think it's really important to think about the way, um, the institutional spaces that we um, exist in and the ways in which um, we can collaborate across departments, right? The, because I think I think um, you know that this effort um, is joint between Chicana, oh excuse me, Chicano Latino Studies and English. And um, typically, I think it would be seen as something that uh, the Chicano Latino Studies Department would undertake, <laughs> right? But because we have been able to um, um, hire more faculty in the English department that focus on Latina, Latino, Latinx literature, um, or who are <laughs> Latinx, um, we've been able to sort of, as Mathie was saying, build this critical mass where we are a uh, um, we're able to put on this larger event because no one person 
is having to bear the the uh, workload of putting together this type of event as Anna, we have to recognize what um, once did, right? As she described. Um, so I think um, that it's absolutely essential to recognize that we belong in different spaces within the university, not just ethnic studies departments, <laughs> right? So uh, um, I guess a larger conversation <laughs> to, to be had, I'll leave it there. I love everything you said, Araceli, that last point about we belong in other spaces besides just ethnic studies. I think that's really um, important also um, for, for our colleagues to hear, for our students to hear, for our audience, for this conference to hear. Um, when Araceli and Dennis were hired in the English department the same year, oh my God, <laughs> it was like, oh. We were so excited. You remember, maybe the conversations we would have, we were just so excited to meet you. We were so excited we were going to be able to work with you. And it was almost, it was almost automatic that we, you know, we just joined together. I mean, we had similar interests. Um, uh, we were able to give mutual support to each other. Um, and again, this critical mass, right? So for us, that critical mass, you know, here we are five people that but it really, it makes an incredible difference, right? When you have this, this kind of people power, where people have the same passion, right? Um, for the literature, um, it makes a big, big difference. And um, it's really, you know, the, these kindred spirits working together in, in an institution that, as we all know, can be very um, alienating and isolating for certain communities especially, right? And, um, and in our departments, we have, you know, had support, right, from many of our colleagues, but there are, of course, some places and some departments where people don't have that kind of support. And so to be able to go into different departments and meet colleagues from different departments, it can make such a difference to your experience on campus. So again, this is speaking to to those of you who are thinking about collaborations, um, don't uh, be shy, right? About reaching out across your college um, or across the university, right? Um, I've done, uh, I've co-organized events with, colleague, with the colleague Katha Paquette, many events in um, the College of the Arts, right? And, um, and those have worked out beautifully um, so don't, don't be, um, don't, don't limit yourself, right? Um, you will find um, that support, those voices across many, uh, many places, right? And in many spaces. Um, and it, it will only, it will only enrich your career, I promise. Um, it will only enrich your career because this is, you know, when I, when I look back on, you know, 23 years at Cal State Long Beach, this event, and, and I'm going to continue, obviously, you know, working with all of you at every opportunity, um, this is definitely one of the highlights for me, right? And, uh, and I don't know, I think, you know, others, others uh, have expressed that as well. Um, so, you know, I tell new faculty coming in just in general, um, don't limit where you're going to look for support. You might find that support in, you know, the least obvious places sometimes. Um, and so um, that's just my long, my long winded way of saying Araceli and Dennis coming to campus and then Vene joining us and, you know, Kiki seeing her from undergraduate to graduate to faculty and of course Dennis um, and Jeanette just seeing everybody's, you know, evolution and our evolution as a committee has been just wonderful. Um, I hope everybody makes this opportunity for themselves in, in their spaces. Very well we said. Kiki? Yeah, we absolutely. Left. Absolutely. I, just, I was I was just about to go to you. No, I just want to thank you. Since we have a minute left, I just want to piggyback on everything that Anna and Araceli and Mathie and Renee have said, but not um 
not just reaching out and uh, making this comunidad um, among faculty, but to our students. I think this is a wonderful mentorship opportunity to get them involved in leadership. I mean, we definitely use them for, you know, for their grunt, for their work, you know, they're helping us set up the reception and, and man the doors at, at the lecture, but also when they go before these committees to ask for the um, funding, right, for the proposals, working on them with the proposals, um, letting them understand how this process works, um, putting them in charge or actually giving them a say on who we're going to bring to campus, listening to who they want us to bring um, is a really great time to foster uh, those, again, mentorship and just working together with our students. The only problem is, you know, we get this great bunch and we have them for a year or two and then we got to start over again so that wheel continues to turn. But I think, um, you know, it's a wonderful time to bring students, faculty, and everyone together, and, and outside members from the community together. Thank you. And you reminded me, Kiki, of um, two things about our students that one, our logo is a student created, right, which is, I think, an excellent, uh, excellent logo. And the other thing I was reminded of, I know it's been so long since we've done one of these, that we actually had the participants of the workshop who volunteered to do a, a reading of, of their own before the main speaker. And that was awesome to see the parents came early, uh, you know, to the event to, to hear uh, these students read their work that they had written that day. So imagine kind of the courage and, that it takes to, to write something in the morning and then to perform it essentially for uh, semi-crowded, of course it's early, but still for an auditorium of people um, was, was one of my favorite aspects of, of this. So the, yes, the student aspect of it, not only the faculty and, and what we've uh, built kind of as a, as a small community of our own, but from the student perspective, I think it's very important to, uh, to recognize their involvement in all this and their importance in all of this. Do you have our logo handy? I do. I'd love to show it. Yeah, right? absolutely. I was going to insert it at the beginning of the video and I'll still do that, but please, yeah. Absolutely. It's also in the slide I showed, but definitely show the large version. Yeah. Um, oh, where's my screen share? Okay. Is it not sharing? There we are. Can we see it? Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about the process, but this was not an easy <laughs> or quick process, I should say, but I think we ended up with something really beautiful here. And this is obviously a tribute to Elena Maria Viramontes and her book, The Moths. This is the Luna Moth is what we ended up with, with the um, coming out of the pages of the book. I love it so much. It's so beautiful. Yeah, very talented student. But it took some doing, of course, you know, a lot of tweaks, a lot of versions. That's probably version 10 or so of the design. But in the end, I think it's perfect for uh, to represent this fabulous lecture series that personally I'm very happy to be uh, a part of. Before we started recording, we were talking about uh, the amount of work that it takes, but uh, a lot of other university work um, or committee work requires work, but I'd be happy to leave that behind and just continue on this. Uh, only, of course, this never feels like a chore, right? So these meetings have been, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure to work with you all and to put on this, this event. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to doing so again in the future once we get back to somewhat regular business on campus and then hopefully in the future uh, back to some kind of normal where we can continue the really great work of this lecture series. Uh, so with that, I'd like to say thank you uh, to Mathy specifically for organizing the panel, to all my colleagues here for sharing their insights, and also thank you to the ALA for providing us with the opportunity to present virtually. Uh, if you, the viewer, would like to learn more about the Vida Montes Lecture Series, you can follow us on Twitter at HMV Lecture, and I'll insert that somewhere, or visit vidamonteslecture.com. And thank you all for viewing. Until next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening.